And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two returning brothers to the temple, creators, uh, creators of the upcoming Player's Guide for Dalrith, he Heaven in the Ice, in the... And the and and possibly the rare case of a couple of a couple Wisconsinites I can actually stand. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm from well, Minnesota. You... you know how the rules go. Well, Mildra, um, I'm not originally from Wisconsin. I'm from Illinois, so uh, that does. I just get to laugh at that one. Oh, oh, bears! Oh, bears! I'm just That's here. Even worse. You're, you're Wisconsin enough. You've been there twenty years. Oh, come on! You, you, I'm you ice count. stuck. You the ice froze around me up here, you know. Yeah. Hi, thanks for well, thanks for having us. I'm Darren. Yeah, the one, the, one, <laughs> the one and only Darren M. Anderson and Andrew Soldati, aka um, the Abbott and Costello of D and D. <laughs> uh, howdy, folks. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. So, last time I last time I had you on, that was let me let me um see if I can check the date. Let me see if I can check the date of that um initial video. Um, which is not letting me do unless I oh unless I open up the thing. So give me a se give me a hot second. I never claim to have the most prof once again. I never claim to have the most professional podcast. Um, <laughs> I thought it was in March, perhaps. Uh, it was back in May. Okay. Yeah. So be back in May, we t we had t we we had talked a bit of broad strokes about Dareth. So, what's aside from the um, launch of the Kickstarter for the Player's Guide? What's been going down in the meantime? Sure. Let me give you a quick overview of what's happening. So, we did launch the Player's Guide yesterday. So mm -hmm. we still have some really cool stuff out there um, for early. I call them early dragon bonuses. So anybody wants to hop on, um, they're available. Um, and so we, a friend of mine, put together some. There's really badges of each of the house factions. Are about three inches tall and a good three and a half millimeters thick, solid. It feels like steel. It's like a zinc alloy. Um, very nice stuff. Each of the different houses eventually will will be producing badges for all of those, so you can uh, kind of align with what faction you want, or you know, have some kind of a fun convention gimmick or whatever you want to wear at a con. But uh, they're really nice and designed. So we've done, worked on those. We've got about thirty more miniatures that all the STLs have been done for and are being in the mastering stages. Um, so this includes uh, like. Uh, uh, some of the different race, races and species and cultures that we'll be releasing as part of the um, project. So, uh, and then also the books. And we've been busy at work um, writing the books and really looking at doing some of the play testing for some of the new players' material. The badge is pretty darn good size. It, you could, it doubles as a pretty darn good cloak brooch, also. Mm -hmm. Just a, a nice piece of metal. If yeah. I, if I ever um, if I set if I set up some sort of some sort of cloak for for any future uh, costume stuff, I'll probably end up using that. I um, I've always Thanks. I've always I've I've had people tell me that I need that I, sh that I need to wear that I need to wear some sort of some sort of long black cloak, but I'm afraid if I do, I'm gonna end up scaring people. Is <laughs> <laughs> the last. The last Always time I dressed in a, the last time I dressed in a suit, my old man said I looked like an undertaker. <laughs> Perfect. Well, then you're going to need an exile badge. You don't want the Barton one. You're going to want the exile. Um, That's with the the one with the dra uh, the the snake eye in the middle of it. It's like a green badge. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So the last now for now first off, I do. There is a small part of me that will always find some amusement that a that a that a bunch of mid a bunch of Midwest gamers ended up making a um a campaign setting that is sent that is centered around a frozen wasteland. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> who, who knows better than frozen wasteland and people in the Midwest, yeah, right? You know, October through March, the sun doesn't shine and you got to do something. So, yeah, yeah the, this this has been, yeah, we this has been in the making for, you know, well over a couple decades. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's just fabulous how it's all transpired uh, from, uh, although not as brutal as they used to be, but you know, the 30 below wind chill, uh, I guess, could be inspirational. <laughs> um, well, my 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 approach is my belief has always been. Um, it's not it's it's not the. Um, it's not the it's it's um, not the cold, it's the wind chill. <laughs> um, Absolutely. You know it's cold when your snot freezes. So we're all <laughs> well. We're I, I know. I know it's cold. I know it's cold when I'm praying. When I'm praying to the when I'm praying to the gods that the car starts. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um. Now, when it, now, just to just to kind of get things up to speed, um, what what can what can somebody expect from Dalreth as a um, campaign setting like what are what are you guys emphasizing what are you guys um de-emphasizing and what might people have to um unlearn jumping in from vanilla D&D into a setting like Dalreth Sure let me let me take that one and I'll have Andy kind of add in a few things here so I think what you need to look at is we we're building this from the player's guide up Mm -hmm. So uh, right now you could take the player's guide, you can use it in uh, any setting that you wanted to. You could supplement, um, for example, if you're playing Icewind Dale, this could be used right there. You could drop I the Delreth in a North Pole in any setting, the South Pole of any setting, and kind of have it be an additional um, add-on when we get to the, when we get it all produced. So uh, it's really being designed to be seamless, but as for it being different than vanilla D and D, one of the things that I do, and one of the characteristics I do when I write things and when I run events, is it's not a railroad storyline. You can't just sit there and follow the storyline and not really have to figure it out. There's a chance that you could miss the entire plot, and that's okay. I've done so that. You could, play, <laughs> you could play like Andy did for 15 years, and he still doesn't know. Andy, who's Infernius? Exactly. <laughs> Andy, okay. who's Infernius? Have you met him? I, I know now only because I, I've, I've been privy with the, with the design you know tab. But other than that, never heard of him. Never heard of him. Did you ever go to the Scarth Mansion? Did you ever investigate that? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, no. so we have material that is, when I design it, is you don't have to follow the plot line. You could follow a different angle. So that the people that are playing vanilla D&D &D have, have this um, viewpoint a lot of times where you have linear. to follow the path. It's linear. And, for example, no one would ever design an encounter that you have to be able to swim to get to because that would mean you had to have somebody who could swim in the party, Right or maybe everybody that could swim. No adventure is going to be designed where the adventure ends at that point, but that I'll do that. So you could have, not the whole book won't end, but that subsection, that's, that area, you won't go find the magic longsword that's down that tunnel if you don't have somebody who can actually get there to get it. Yeah. So I think that's the big paradigm shift you're going to find. If you're playing, if you're used to playing vanilla D&D, you don't actually have to develop a character in a special way. You don't have to play it in a special way. You just kind of follow the railroad and you're all okay. Every, everybody's going to be happy. Not quite so much here. Mm -hmm. So I think and, DMs will like that for a change. Go ahead, Andy. You well, I was ahead. just going to say it gives DMs uh, an, opportunity, an opportunity not to candy coat it either. Um, as, as, as far as uh, the uh, it, like the formula that the the tournament sets is you got to have x number x number of hit dice equals x x of the party member and the, the, this is not formula related. What's there is there, and if you're low level, you you, you know that's probably not a good good idea. You know, good idea to to bite off uh, a more meaty adventure, death is very pliable, a very, pl very much an option um, if, if you don't play smart. 
um, so so it, it adds it adds a little bit of you know more reality twist to it rather than um, it, it gives DMs to add that reality side to it rather than just uh, have them have the mule follow the carrot kind mm -hmm. of thing. And then I think beyond that, right? That's just the the playing field, so to speak, that they'd have to learn. And but beyond that is the political playing field. So I have over a hundred characters that just have been fairly well defined with artwork now. And they'll be stat block, but they'll beyond just a stat block and a piece of art is all their motivations, personality, and and how they interact. And they do things even when the players aren't around. So when you interact with an, with a non-player character, ticks. the t time still goes on, and yeah. events still happen, and the clock still ticks. So. And your reputation builds or declines. So the next time that person that you slighted earlier might have something that they do to you the next time they see you, or not help you. They don't have to, right? It's so it's a, a little bit of a a real world, like you're walking through a, a big city and. When I first went into Chicago, um, I'm from a rural rural area. When I first went to Chicago, a lot of that feeling I remember that first time I was there was like, nobody really cares about me here. There's a lot of people here, right? And uh, the, the that's kind of what the, the view of the city is here, is that you're just kind of that person who just walked into a big city for the first time and never seen one before. So mm -hmm. that's I think that's different. A lot of the material that most companies put out will have four or five characters defined in an entire city of 50,000 people. That's not so much here. We have quite a bit of detail built in. So those are the big things is there's a lot of detail within a city. There's a lot of um, different playing field to make it feel a little bit more real. And the adventure's really a sandbox type of adventure, but with plots that do happen. So it's not purely do as you want. There are plots well, that could occur if you don't react to them. Well, well no, it's it's do it's do as you want. Yeah, and and the plot's still going to happen. It's how you choose to interact with with the occurrences that are going to happen regardless. Yeah. Now when it now when it comes to the, when it comes to the um book when it comes to the player's guide itself. Now would you, would you say that um that the that the um the amount of material that's for players and the amount of material that's for um GMs is on um is 60 40 um players or would you say it's a, a diff would you say it's a different ratio player's so guide the, is mostly players do you when you say yeah yeah so the player's guide's really for both so it's a, it's 100% for the players but the the GM's really going to want a copy to get the material that's in it that won't just be a reprint. So don't think of the player's guide like you do from other games that might be a subset of another book. It'll be a, a book that stands on its own. Um, and it'll be a supplemental book. What we did is we took all of the, the new species, the cultures, all the spells, everything that we wanted to expand the game with and threw it into what we're calling the player's guide. And so it's really, think of it as book one. Um, for it because then that's the building block for the next book which will be the creatures and then the creatures plus this will be where all the adventure material will be derived from and all the NPCs will be built mm -hmm. off, off the players templates so that's kind of what it is in, in terms of how the products place the material in the players guide I think you'd be best to understand it's probably 70 to 80 percent crunch material and probably 20 to 30 percent more campaign fluff mm -hmm. so if you're buying this for your own campaign you probably wouldn't care about the arctic chapters about arctic survival um or harsh weather survival you would probably not need those chapters but that's less than 20 20 to 30 percent is the campaign fluff the other rest the rest of it's really the crunch that you could use in any game so there's a lot there that you could use for your own game if you didn't even want to set your game in yeah. in a Del Ross setting. Now, speak, speaking of the new species and cultures, now we we did kind of delve into this a little bit, but I'd I'd be I'd like to um I'd like to go a little bit more whole hog into into some of these um, species and cultures within the um, setting. Okay. So now when it comes... Now, oh, I want to split this into two parts. 
The first is how um is when it when it comes to already existing races within D and D, um, how are they being reinterpreted in Dalrith's um setting? I.e., what's get, what's going to be easy to adapt, what's going to be harder to adapt, and what's going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree? Human is to human, right? You know, ice, ice elves are the are a unique new breed of elf. Yeah. Um. It's hundred. Same thing with the tundra dwarfs. Uh. Our 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 hobbits are. Uh. You know. Again, another unique. Uh. You, you, we've basically ta taken at, at least one. Uh, of every race and and made a u unique sub race of it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not it. truly a sub race in D and five e terms. They're they're their own new race. New race, I guess, would be a more. I call them. Yeah. I, I use the word species, and sometimes I use them interchangeably. But but you know whether you use species or race, I think of the different creatures as different species but that's from my biology background mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so the the halflings we have are gold halflings like andy mentioned they're they're essentially like halflings but they won't have the lucky feet for example so we get rid of the lucky feet and they'll have they have other abilities that they do that that aren't lucky you know for that the humans will have very similar they'll feel the same but there's two types of humans there's the city humans which are a mix of of cultures that have mixed together in a city because that's where the haven is and then there's a tribal element that's more of the indigenous people that called the kuda tribe that are living in um kind of a tundra valley if that makes sense so there's two types of humans i think in 5e you would call them standard humans and variant humans mm -hmm. right i think that's the term so those are actually two different cultures rather than they say they're the tundra dwarves like andy mentioned are essentially kind of like a mountain dwarf but instead of some of the abilities that mountain dwarfs have instead of being resistant to poison they're resistant to cold because they tunnel through the ice the elves are up on catamarans on the tops of the glacier and they skim and so instead of some of the, the abilities that normal elves would have these elves have more wind magic so they have some inherent wind magic as well mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the common races that you know and love are slightly tweaked and they're usable in any setting. So you could add your ice elves into your setting and have them from be up by some mountainous region that's away from where it's at and drop these right into your game. They're not a reprint. We're not reprinting the, the standard races, if that, if that, if that makes sense. So it's all usable, right? There are, there are a couple, um, there are a couple of examples of races that are standard that I'm curious if they'd be easier or trickier to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I want to ask about is um, tieflings. Oh, that's a good one. So Infernius is the, the demon of, uh, of legend that crashed upon the land and brought about the cataclysm. And it's rumored, rumored, not been seen, that he has humanoid spawn that are derived from his blood. And so the tieflings aren't just a generic tiefling, they're what I call Infernius spawn. But essentially it's the same template. It's different. Mm -hmm. The the SRD doesn't, I believe the tiefling is not something allowable in the SRD, so they're different enough to be unique, but it fills that gap that you would see in a normal tiefling type. Yeah. of environment um, so we're, we're, we're not treading on the any intellectual property we're creating our own new thing yeah. but it's similar enough to where you could call it a tiefling yeah um in that regard what about um dragonborn now dragonborn we don't have anything made for at this point we're still debating on that one right andy whether we want to have you know dragon people yeah i'm my vote is a big no on that one just that's just uh yeah, I'm 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 more of a core kind of person. I always I never was a fan of it. Uh, more purist am I? So yeah. So I think that the compromise, and we've already developed this other. We have um, a handful of other. We have a other, handful of replacement uh, that yes. kind of wet the dragonborn appetite, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If for those that want something off the beaten cuff. Y y well, I don't know what you want to let out of the bag. Do you, I'll, let out, I'll let them out. I'll let I'll open for Mildred. I'll open the whole bag up because it's <laughs> it's coming right. So mm -hmm. we've got yeah. we've got Ursidae and they're bears. Mm -hmm. 
so that that that's for the the Goliath slash um, Dragonborn concept, right? Where they're the bigger, they don't breathe fire or breathe breathe any kind, you know, lightning or whatever. Yeah. But they 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 they, they kind of realistic. fill a little bit of that gap. Um, and they're they're polar bear type people in Ursidae. We also have wolf people. Um, I don't think I've released the name yet. Um, so I'll keep that tight for the yeah. moment. Just got to make yeah. sure we can get, use it in intellectual property. But there's a wolf, like an Arctic wolf type people. And a handful of breed of cats. To, don't we there's have a cat. And well, there's also a fox. There's also a fox. Um, Steenok, I've let that one out of the bag because I think we can... We can we can settle on that. Nick, the the foxes um, the foxes are unique because what they do in this setting is they're kind of symbiotic relationship with the half the gold halflings. The foxes try the foxes kind of harken back to the days of the Kendar, but they're not Kendar, so hopefully you won't think of them as that way. They they like to steal things for sport, whereas the Kendar was like kleptomaniac and couldn't control it. The foxes do it for fun. And when so you say do it for st- fun, is that in a kind of phantom thief kind of way? In in a in a way, it's in a way, it's the the reason for their nature. They just like to steal things and hide them from you because that's their nature. Because a challenge, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that time where you want to do something and you, you know you can get away. the Ferris Bueller kind of thing because you can do it like you're getting away with it <laughs> it's a ferris bueller it's a ferris bueller race i don't know if i can <laughs> use that officially on your podcast or whatever but if you've watched ferris bueller that's pretty much the inspiration for oh, boxes. oh believe me there there's enough people there's enough people on the podcast who are more than familiar with with that movie um especially since i've got especially since i've got more than one more than one person who's who's in chicago on on the show so Oh, okay. So, so yeah, so that's a classic good, for us. You're in good company. Yep. Perfect. So th- think of that. That's where the foxes fit in. There's nothing like that what we've seen. And uh, my friend um, Carl put that together. Carl Danes. He's from the UK area, and uh, he uh, put it all together. And we did it. We kind of worked it all out, and it, it came out. His write up is awesome. So. Um, so we've got that all written up, ready to go. We're going through the editing process to make it make it there and get it to our editor. But so that's one of them. Um, and then he's now working on a a race that's a little bit more. You know, when he brought up Dragonborn, like what what applies to it is a Wolverine based race. So mm-hmm. uh, species based off Wolverine, and they're they're actually going to be Sparta style. So if you saw the movie 300, Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be more of a Spartan style of Wolverines. They won't be a large presence of them. Um, You know, we certainly don't want to have all the dogs and cats in the universe walking around as humanoids. But, but, you know, it's, um, it is something that's, you know, in in the Arctic and, and the fact that part of the background of the game is that that asteroid that hit was in effect had, uh, you know, it's, Part of what we built into it is some radioactive components mm-hmm. or mutation components. So that's what explains what's happened to a lot of the different creatures bugs. and species. Oh, and there's bugs. There's bugs. So we also have um, we also have Jonathan, Jonathan Connor um, put together um, he, Connor put together a uh, a playable species of bugs. I was having him write up my enemies, which were bugs, and he joked back saying, if I write these, I'm going to write up something that everybody's going to want to play. So I said, oh, well, then I guess we better we better just and come up with it. That may be the closest to Dragonborn would be the, couple, would be the bug the race. Bugs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're basically giant bugs um, with obsidian weapons that are sentient. So I'm like, I guess if they're sentient, I guess somebody could play them if they want to. So it may not be in my particular world game. I may not let players play them, but we have them as playable characters because, you know, Connor was like, well, I, people don't want to play these. And I said, I don't see any reason why DM couldn't use them. We're designing all this anyway. Why not just finish it up and make it into a playable? playable well, Dark, Dark Sun got away, with a bu- got away with a bug race all those years ago. So why not? Well, in a way, we're kind of preempting that in a way, right? Because you know that's coming back, I'm sure. Um, so every the rage was going to be bugs in the next year or two when they bring that back, I'm sure. Um, I will hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Good on. 
um, they won't come back the way it was, right? They won't have it, you know, because back then you could you could publish it, and there was a lot of things about Dark Sun that probably wouldn't be publishable today, right? Um, but I um I I don't see I don't see that happening for se- for I don't I don't see it happening for several years, um, but I'm getting ahead of myself now. You had you had mentioned the you had mentioned the branching the branching off when it came to um when it came to things like the elves and dwarves. I'd like to before we delve into the uh, classes part of things, I'd like to delve a bit into that and what's going to make them different from other elves and where they're going to be going against type. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the elves. So the difference um, from the playable elves that we have here is that the elves are masters of wind magic, mm-hmm. okay? So they need to have the wind. So if you imagine the survivors, pre-cataclysmic time, the elves ruled the land. There were millions and millions of elves. Mm-hmm. Um, a group of elves decided they weren't happy that everybody else was happy, kind of like what always happens in any society, right? Mm-hmm. They felt they were better than everybody. They turned to dark arts, and they proved to everybody they could make make things change and they did and summoned forth the demon Infernius who crashed into the land and made things change and so the survivors of the elves that were in the cult went underground for time since um, pre-recorded history they've been hiding deep deep down underneath in caves and caverns the elves that did survive tried to survive on the surface and the survivors of the, or the remaining of those who survived developed ice skimming um, catamarans and, and focused all of their magic on wind magic to keep the ships powered. And survival. Up on, and survival. Up on the glacier, glacier, glacier survival. Yep, cold, cold being the big thing, right? So the thinking is, is it's almost like a natural... They didn't have resistance to cold, they would die off. So if you think... Again, my background being in biology, I hope everybody forgives me for that. I think to draw everything back to some type of science. Um, if you think about it through natural selection, the uh, the ones that weren't able to survive in a cold would die. So those who had that type of ability survived and that's what's left of the elves. Now, in a normal campaign, these elves, would you use an elf like this in a non-ice setting? Possibly, it'd be unique. Um, you know, it wouldn't be as effective, you know, cold, cold resistance isn't effective in the desert, obviously, as it would be in the ice, but, um, but it's still something that would make him unique. Mm-hmm. And we also expand in the player's book a lot of cold-based spells. So if you bring in the cold-based spells, it's also nice to have the option for more players to be cold-resistant. Um, because right now most things are fire resistant, so a lot of our book will have cold, you know, cold resistance. And the future creature book will, of course, be filled with different types of resistant creatures as well. Cold being one of them. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, get when it comes to early, when it comes to the um, dwarves that you have as a variant. I, th- I think before I think before um, before we went on, before we went live, you had mentioned that they're more akin to uh, teamsters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the dwarves the dwarves are organized into what what's called the glacier guild. Okay, and mm-hmm. what they do is they do um, they they Great. move the goods through the glacier between the city and the adjoining Kuta Valley where there's food. So if you think about it, it's like you you, you got to kind of go through the dwarves if you want to safely move your goods to the glaciers. Because glaciers move, mm-hmm. you know, and they change. It's cold. It's icy. Like Russia's oil pipeline to Western Europe. or to, yeah, Kind of, right? Kind of. And they're the, they're the people that drive the carts. And if you want your stuff there, you want it on time, you're going to pay them for the service fees to, to do that. You can go through the glaciers yourself and try to figure your own way past through right andy and see how that yeah gets you. yeah it's worse than a that's worse than a minotaur's labyrinth yeah yeah so, or you could just give or some, you could just get your dwarf and pay him some and then yeah, pay him some money yeah. pay him your pay him the dues and you're pay the go. dwarf your union pay dues dwarf. right pay the so, dwarf. yeah pay the dwarf so that's kind of how they're set up so they're they're an interesting they're not your um they're not your crafters that you would normally see in most settings it's more of a more of a, I, I can get you something kind of kind of race Mm -hmm. um so that's kind of what they've turned into at least in our setting now how that could apply in other settings of course 
could be they could be part of some merchants guild, right? So that's that's where the, their their natural abilities would shine. Um, so if you wanted a dwarf that was different in your world that wasn't always the one that's underground with a with a hammer and anvil and that's what they were, you know, you could have them play them a little bit more more spunk to them, right? Where they're uh, more of a more of a kind of a coercive type dwarf. Like you want my services? Mer mercenary might be a good term for them as well. Yeah. Paid, yeah, can... paid done. <laughs> um, well, when you mentioned mercenary, the first thing that came to mind is the is that old line from um, Goodfellas: "The whole fuck you pay me." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I guess give... that's maybe the Goodfellas dwarves, then, right? Well, yeah, pretty well, much. If you remember, if you remember in the Wizardry games, we had a we had a rat mafioso, so why not? <laughs> yep. yep. Um, now... and, and, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, in shifting gears, as far as the craft, you know, the Bartons, the Bartons are the, are the masters of of, uh, of pounding out armor. Mm -hmm. So, so where where dwarves would traditionally have that role, it's actually one of the house factions. Yeah. Now... Which goes back to our awesome, <laughs> awesome brooch. Yeah. <laughs> that was nanny. Um... Good plug there. Uh... Yeah. I'm sorry, you were saying, sir. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, subclasses, um, what I'm curious what I'm curious about is what what can you obviously we obviously we can't go whole hog detail onto all onto all twelve of them. Otherwise, we'd be here for six hours. But what can what can you tell me about what some about what some of them um, bring to the table and what they um and how they alter the sandbox of some of the existing classes. Sure. I'll I'll start with that one, and then, Andy, you can chime in. So the biggest class addition that you're going to find is something that we were previously calling a mentalist. Mm -hmm. But um, I found out, actually, that's a term used for people of opposing um, English football um factions when they don't like the uh, fans of another faction to call mentalists is in a derogatory way i guess so mm -hmm. so i said okay then come up with a better name and so they pitched me mind weaver which sounds pretty cool what do you think andy i hadn't yes that oh, every, yet. Yeah, yeah i everybody yes yes yeah, so carl that's your that's uh, a shout out to carl you're right buddy that's uh, what do you think Mildred? mind weaver better than mentalist yes Okay, so you have a unanimous. So, Carl, if you're listening, um, that was your idea last night at, I don't know, 2 in the morning. You, you chalked that one out to me. So, um, or the night before. I don't know. It all bleed together. So, the, the mind weaver that we'll call him going forward is really, um, think of a, a, it's a wizard type class, but it's not a wizard. It does mind Right, it'll magic. be, you're pure. It's, it's like your pure spellcaster. Yeah, uh, it's a pure spellcaster, but mind spells. Mm-hmm. And then we're also uh, in the, within that same realm. We'll dabble in, uh, you know, the the like as a ranger combines, you know, clerical magic and arms. You know, we'll we'll have. Um, I'm again not uh, I'm not sure on the name, but like a, a a night blade type character or mystic, you know, combining arms and and, and uh, mind weaving, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, then we were actually, um, po we, we haven't flushed it out totally, but also um, monks, uh, they, they, we were having their key, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and the magic that of monks come from more of a mentalist, a mental uh, a mind source, weaver. mind, yeah, weaver, mind source. weaver source. Yep. source. Rather than rather than a channeling clerical or essence, uh, you know, magic user uh, so, source, if you will, yeah. Um, like right now, they can use their key to cast a thunder wave and things like this. Uh, it, it's going to be more, uh, yeah, mind oriented uh, uh, magic that's body enhance that that'll enhance be physical enhancement. Uh, for them and that and that kind of thing. So a, again, a couple a couple of them combining arms and mind weaving, and then the pure mind weaving class, mm -hmm. also. And this all derives from us having played role master 
this system originated in a role master environment. So they had all that built in. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, taking the, the origins of what I built into the world that's already there. And how do you make that work in 5e? Right. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a translation effort. So that's when you hear what we're working on. We've, we, we know what we want as an end result and how it should function. It's just how to make the nuanced into 5e. So that's a spell level was, slots, everything's yeah, balanced, all that. Do, yeah. Dalreth was originally, when we started at first level, we, we started as role master characters. And then yeah. around fifth level, went over to Pathfinder and then. Yeah, and then so forth. And then, then the 5e and so forth. So, yeah, yeah the game has tra has ha has migrated. But, it, but again, there's so many uh, great aspects with that original that original game set. And that's what we're trying to capture in, in the production of this, this book. So, yeah. So those are two of them, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the Mindweaver is kind of a new... A completely new class, and mm -hmm. that could be dropped in anywhere. The challenge, I just want to talk about that, if you don't mind, for a couple minutes. The challenge yeah. of a Mindweaver class is how do you make a Mindweaver not completely blow your plot away? And that's, in, in, in Role Master, that's not a problem, but in 5e, that could be a problem because you could just go and read everybody's mind and know what you Well, and, 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 and we've talked about this, D, yeah. as far as resistance, in, uh, as far as more of a level playing field as far as level to level resistances and the like. So resistances um, or, or knowledge that it's and, happening and, to you, you know, and, that you're being right. mind read. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you, one thing we also discussed was that at higher levels, I'm sorry, you, you know, you get a 14th or fifth level mind weaver and it, against a normal lower level person, you know, they lose, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just reality. Right. You, you, you know, and I think that could be said for any class when there's a level difference like that. And then if it's, you know, with and if it's level compatible, they'll be, you know, uh, they'll be right, you know, right, righteous, even uh, saves, if you will, you know, we'll, we'll imp implement that resistance, if you will. So that's going to take some balance, but just wanted to let you know, that's yep. definitely going to be a playable class. Um, and so it really, it harkens back to the old days. The monk, uh, we were looking at adding in the magical element of the monk. We're also looking at a more of a martial, um, straight monk. And mm -hmm. back again, harkening back to our old days, they called those, um, warrior monks. Yep. Now, and so, so let's talk about that for a minute, if you don't mind. And right now they have in, in the regular, uh, players, you know, 5e players guide, they have the regular monk. You know where I think they have the shadow, which dabbles in illusion, the elementalist that dabbles in the elements, and then they have their the regular one that does the flurry of blows. That, mm -hmm. that you, you know, and they they touch on it. But if you think about it, if you have a, a monk that is totally dedicated himself, oh, and he, and then in the in in Xanathar's they have the weapon. You know, the the, the can say the weapon monk. Mm -hmm. There, they don't have. What they don't have, and what we're putting in, is a monk that is total balls out fighter. Okay, like a total balls out fighting fighting type monk without the weapons, just total martial arts. And if if you look at um, like what the battle master is for the fighter, with all of those uh, choices that they have, we basically in the in in a martial art sense, you know, kind of level the playing field. It, and have you know a, a warrior monk that dedicates himself to, to that kind of combat or that kind of uh, you know combat discipline should be uh, ready to kick as much ass as a battle master <laughs> fighter um, at, uh, of the same level. Mm -hmm. Again, no no monk that I uh, to this to this point I don't think has has really stressed the all out combat. Uh, side of it, so that's what we're that's what we're uh, bl blasting out a little bit on the on the warrior monk. But I know yeah. you, that's new, near and dear to your heart, Moldris. So what are you thinking of? I know you mentioned you alluded last time to, you know, maybe a better monk class, or they're not functioning right. Are we hitting it close, or are we still? Yeah, it's yeah, it's because the thing that the thing that I want the thing that I wanted and why I was kicking around the idea of designing a a. Um, a monk equivalent that I called Pugilist, which I, um, I've, op I've opted to put on hold until, and 
put pending how that um advanced 5e thing that en world is developing turns out because i want i want to mm -hmm. see how that spins and whether or not they touched on the same idea as i did um what i wanted was for it was to have a was to have a monk that um is not re is not relying on any sort of supernatural um resource um simply because, oh, raw ability yeah because right that's like our warrior monk that's what i'm going for with the warrior but go ahead because um, given 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 some of the given the um I feel I feel like I feel like using key as the as the gimmick for the monk to justify why they're able to do all these different abilities, um, kind of undercuts it. Because my vision of my vision of the monk character in that in that sense has whether whether it be weapons or not with weapons has been somebody who is who has been so dedicated to mastering their craft. That they're able that they're able to do things that aren't possible simply because of that pure dedication. You, if you read a lot of um, Wuxia and Tianxia materials, you'll see this kind of motif. Um. But by bring but the way key is used, it's based. They're basically being made into um, Shadowrun style adepts, which I've got no problem with on paper, but. At the end, at the end of the day, I I I'd, I'd like to, um. Also, to put things in perspective, I am um, I'm a big fan of the manga Berserk. And, a character like Guts is some is somebody who, isn't used is despite having some um supernatural equipment. He's largely gotten by in his on his own skills. Now that's um that's oversimplifying it, but that sort of pure martial ability is is something that I wanted to see. And so so far the appro the the first party approaches with the monk um weren't cutting it. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm that's why I'm looking forward to seeing the um the seeing the warrior monk cuz I I did like monks in Rollmaster. I had a lot of fun with them. Then again, I I had a lot of fun with a lot of things in Rollmaster because I, I um I want I want to try and get I want to try and get a t-shirt made to um based on based on what Against the Dark Master is doing that just says make criticals hurt again. <laughs> is, well, pick out one of my pieces of art and I'll get that out there for you. Mm -hmm. Any of the art you want, I'll put it out there for you. Um, and we can say that yeah, if I if I do that, I'll have I'll have to give I'll of course I have to give credit to um the um open open one hundred team team that develops against the dark master because they um were the ones who was oh, that one it. of their quotes that was oh, that was a okay. quote that was a quote they had they had on their on their Twitter a few times and I'm like we we need to make we need to make this spread <laughs> um, yeah uh, dang we well, could we could put down their quote afterwards, mm -hmm. and you could give them credit, right, in your shirt. Yeah. But yeah, if you want a piece of art for, I've got one with a guy getting an arrow right in his eye, so I've got a piece of art for you that. Know, and, and that's you know that's something, you know, maybe maybe by the third book, we'll, we can drop drop a redo of that <laughs> into the. I don't. I don't. We've debated on the criticals in Five E, and I think it's. Uh, I almost think it's a rabbit hole to be honest with you for Five E. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have I have my own I have my own approaches when it now obviously tr obviously trying to transfer the criticals from Rollmaster into Five E is a um is um a piss hole in a snowbank. Um, well, we've done it. We did it. We for actually Pathfinder. did it. Yeah, oh, we did yeah, it. For we, we actually used the use those criticals in our Pathfinder game <laughs> on a net, on a net. You'd actually you'd actually roll percent and the good the 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 second. Second edition strength table, that percentage chart mm -hmm. is what we use for A, B, C, and D. So your one to fifty was an A, you know, up to seventy five B, C, D. Did you separate it between di between different types of um, weapons, like cut? Like, absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. Yep. Okay then, I'll, okay then. I um, I stand, I stand corrected on that. Yeah, yeah we yeah, could, yeah, we could. Yeah. It was a one page write up. I could dig it up and send it over to you. Just yeah. To say, oh wow, this yeah, you could we, use. We did master. implement them, but yeah. the thing is. 
Yeah. Yeah, those are their criticals, you, you know, and uh, yes, I love them, but you, you know, there, there's no SRG for those. SRD, <laughs> yeah. SRD sorry. SRD yeah. for the, for those. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but, but from a, you could just take their product though, mm -hmm. right. Use the one pager that we put together. I, in fact, I may put that out there in my website at delreth.com. If anybody pings me other than, well, I'll do it for you, Miltra and Andy. <laughs> we'll put it out there. I have it typed up. I, I just need to put it, you know, just need to format it and I'll put it out there. Mm -hmm. It was a one pager and it worked really, really well. The system was, it was brutal though. Mm -hmm. And, and in a way though, for, for us to do that for 5e, I don't think that, I don't think that, that would have to truly be an, uh, you know, an optional system mm -hmm. and, and rewriting all the criticals, I think is a, a, a laborious task for a small market, mm -hmm. but you, if those of you who are Rollmaster fan, by all means, yeah, I, I'd love to implement. We even had a way to heal them too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you had a broken bone, what it took in What's at a, the time, that, half uh, fighter, bone is your critical. Or right. Cure Serious. Right, took a Cure Serious yeah, at that time. Cure Serious, we had it, we had like where the your 5e healing, you know, just categorizes for every severity of, of the hit or of, of the, of the whether it be broken bone or crushed skull or whatever. Yeah. Oh, speaking of crushed skull. Yeah, speaking of crushed skull. So part of another class that we have, if we don't mind us moving mm -hmm. the subject off monks yet, are you okay go, with that one? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so so warlocks. We've never, none of us have ever been really happy with warlocks. So we decided to kind of, if you remember the Harkin days of of Rollmaster, there was a class or yeah, a class called a sorcerer that did mm -hmm. things like bad things to people. So we've mm -hmm. kind of thought, well, the warlock kind of fits like a sorcerer was. Um, not to be confused with the five E sorcerer, which is weird. Um, in and of itself for its own reasons. But so what we've decided to do over in the Warlock class within our, our guide is to have them cast some new spells that are the old sorcerer spells that you would have gotten out of Rollmaster, but of course, completely different visions to them and versions to them, but those kind of damaging spells. So for example, um, instead of doing the blade and the warlock becomes kind of a weird fighter. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that warlocks do in 5e um, to more kind of harken back more of a spellcaster. So we're looking at a subclass of a warlock that's a spellcaster subclass that focuses on things that break bones, for example. So they can cast a spell that'll break your arm. Sprained limb. Sprained mm -hmm. limb. So those types of things. And so those, and then we have mechanics built into the spell of how do you heal it, right? Because D&D doesn't really have a, a simple way to how do you, you know how you don't have a spell that you know fixes somebody's neck. So right? again, again, a cure light. You know, a cure wound spell will cure a sprain. You know, a cure serious or cure moderate wound will cure a, a, a break. Right, and in five e that translates to the number of hit points that you mm -hmm. can deliver in a round. So if you can if you can cure a certain number of hit points, then you can cure that particular. Or on Critical the serious thing. ones, if you cannot, on a serious break, if you cannot, on a broken leg, if you cannot, if you personally cannot cure 20 hit points with one spell in one round, you better be double and triple teaming it with your buddies if you yeah. want that leg fixed. And if you still can't get it fixed, then you might have to wait a few months for it mm -hmm. to heal naturally. And that's built into what we're doing with the Warlock. So it's kind of, a, if you think of the old Sorcerer, it's not the same, but I, that's what it harkens back to from that is that it'll be um, those types of spells. So it's kind of interesting, you know, some of the things we've done to it is to take things we've seen other places, ways we've played it and try to translate it and make it kind of fit um, in a new way. People who've never played those other systems and, um, you know, other games, you know, would see that. But I don't think we're going to touch criticals. I think that's um, that's just a lot of overhead in some ways. Yeah, I can de I can definitely see see how that'd be the case. Um, now, when it, now, um, pre previously we, I do distinctly remember that, um, the last time I had you on, we had ragged on um, we had ragged on Rangers pretty hard. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Are they getting a subclass treatment for this? Yes, they got. Uh, they can actually shoot a bow now. Yeah, <laughs> better than other people. Better yeah, than other people. We, we, yeah, we we basically stepped them up to where they they yeah. They're, it's basically a wicked archer subclass mm -hmm. to where they're doing where they're comparable. Uh, 
you know, with a, with a fighter of almost the same level, you know, uh, uh, almost as comparable as a fighter, fighter of the same level. Um, so yeah, it, it, we, we, yeah, we made a wicked ranger archer and, um, and, and yeah, I'll leave that there. Yeah. And we do want to, we want to play test that a bit, um, just to make sure that it, I mean, we want it to be dominant and with a bow, but we don't want it to be a dominant character class, if that makes sense to where that everybody's going to, everybody a wants to play a ranger. Fighter. Yeah. Basically I want oh. every, the, up to this point, the winners in this game are a battle master and a thief with advantage. So basically we're trying to even the playing field as far, as far as the other classes go again, like your warrior monk ranger where they can step up and they can kick as much ass as that battle master. Um, now, now granted you still being that he's a pure fighter, you still want to give them the, the, the top, but, but we just want to close the gap. Yeah. Close the gap to where it's freaking decently playable instead of being the pussy of the group. <laughs> Pardon my French. <laughs> no, your fr your French is perfectly vi perfectly viable here. We okay, <laughs> fair. We do not we do not censor anyone's language here in the monastery. Thank you. So so the thing is with the um with the if you think about the the ranger that that's really where we feel rangers need to go we also another thing that was lacking in 5e that i think is at least within the all the games that i've played in it and, and games i've run they don't have a really good grasp of conjuration magic in 5e like they used to so for example druids become some tank of a bear and that's what you play up till fourth level and then you play the druid that does you know an allosaurus after that and then you transform into something better that can fly after that. And uh, druids kind of become hit point tanks rather than what druids used to be. So it feels to me very weird. Like the druids of 5e don't feel like anything out of our past. And I don't know how you feel about that, Mildred, but they just don't feel like a druid to me. Um, an issue I've had with druids on, on and off for a while and um, it's, is... A is a case of to, of um, too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, and I and dabbler is, of many, master of none. It's it's more of it's more of um, when I look at say a wizard, I under, I understand what I'm getting what I'm going to be dealing with when it comes to the fact that they're going to have a wide variety of potential spells. Um, when I look at a sorcerer, I generally have an idea of what I'm going to be dealing with. When I look at a um, fighter or look at a ranger or look at a rogue and so on, I have a general idea of what I'm dealing with. But with with a druid, you have you have the notion of of um of their own their own um, spell casting. You have the notion of them having of them having animal companions. You have the notion of them being able to shape shift and. It's one. It's one of those. It's one of those things where, where um, somebody obviously with all these potentials, somebody who knows what they're doing and can bring a druid up to a up to a tier one class, which is what tier one classes are ones where they um are so useful they're an entire party unto themselves. Um, that's mm -hmm. why Codzilla was a uh, was a thing a, a few years ago. Um. And that's the that's the big problem that I ha that I have with um, druids. I um, if if I found out tomorrow that the whole druid class had been um, se had been segregated into three um, diff into three different types, one focused on like nature spell casting, one focused on um, animal companionship, and one focused on shape shifting, I would be perfectly fine with that. It's ha it's having all the it's having all those three angles at once. When that's not how a lot of other classes are really designed, is where my problem lies. Yeah, and one of the things um, that I don't like is the shape shifting. Um, just don't like the. I played a druid. I played it a lot. It was great for me. Um, they've done it. Anybody can use a standard druid if you like it. You love it. I have a wild shape deck ready to go um, because I do like playing that type of a druid. Um, but after running druids, so it's kind of like as a D as a player, 
I love playing a druid that could do that stuff because, like you said, they're you can make them very potent. As a DM, it gets kind of the same thing, right? You know, he's going to go into a bear on the next round, right? Or, you know what I mean? Like you know the that that's that there's pull your bear and you know you're going to be a bear here, right? So, um, or whatever an allosaurus or whatever it would be, need to be. So from what I what we're, I'm looking at doing on the druid is really taking away that wild shape piece um, and looking at, and this is where the balance needs to come in because we haven't really quite got this perfected yet and we're gonna need to play test it, is to make sure that the Druid itself could then do something that would complement it. Instead of becoming a bear, maybe being able to summon a bear or have a bear companion or something along those lines. If there's a bear nearby, maybe it comes rumbling in three rounds later or, or six rounds later. So that type of thing where the druids aren't the tank, but they can get the help. More of a, more of a Grizzly Adams. Kind mm -hmm. of, right? Yeah, that's really a good, that's a good, good ex explanation. So it doesn't mean you can't play the other druid. Um, either in a game I run or, you know, you, you know, saying and condemning them. I'm just saying that to me, I think that needs kind of an overhaul in the Druid class. So for us, that's what we're looking at doing is some materials for those who also feel the same way is, okay, the, the wild shape is fun to do. Okay, been there, done that. What else can you do with the Druid? That's what we're looking at. There'll still be some spell casting elements to it, but its primary focus, at least in what, what we've written so far, is to have the Druid um, really be able to bring in the nature element of, of you know, the, the, the creatures around him. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and when, when it comes now, um, when it comes to, um, when it comes to feats and given the fact that there's going to be at least 40 feats, um, obviously we can't go into all of them, but, are there are there a few are there a few highlights when it comes to feet design that um really stick out with you, as in as in this was the eureka moment? <laughs> yeah, we have a number we have a number of new things we want feats to do. So one of the things that we found, okay, and and this is just me playing a lot of adventures league, and you really want to have a character that kind of is for whatever game you're running. So a DM that does a homebrew is going to have a different type of character but if you're playing random pickup adventures with random people you don't know you have in the party there's some feats that are must have right so in adventures league play you're going to have somebody sitting at the table most likely who has the lucky feat mm -hmm. right that's that's kind of a must have feat alertness um is a very must have feat, feat especially if you're a row you just got to have alertness right um so you can get that initiative especially if you're an assassin it's a must have feat if you're an assassin so what we're trying to do is kind of get away a little bit from that must have stuff and all and offer a whole different batch of new feats that you as a dm could say okay i want to use these instead you could use them in addition if you want to basically we took, took away the pimps mm -hmm. We yeah, try to yeah get get rid of the ones that are just over, over just too much. I mean, lucky lucky's ridiculous. And, and we don't yes. want to reprint. We can't reprint. It's not in the SRD, and there's no right. point of reprinting it for people. They don't want to see me reprint the same thing that's already been printed in a player's handbook, unless it's for a completionist's sake, you know, to work it all out. So what we did was we reworked the system so that there's different types of feet. So one of the ones, for example, I can give you one that that flows is um, is a death strike feat. So it's one that if you have this feat and you knock somebody to zero hit points, they automatically fail a death save, for example. That's mm -hmm. pretty much how it flows. So it's a death strike. So um, you're one up on on death on, on on saving throws. So that's very potent, um, particularly for NPCs. Maybe not so much for a player, um, because usually when you knock something to zero, most DMs don't worry about that. But against you know something important, perhaps a troll, even that wouldn't matter because they could still regenerate. But that that's where the um, the the death strike would come in at. So that's one of the feats where we kind of like okay, this is a way. One of the ways that the problem with five E in a way is really almost impossible to die, unless you have a DM that amps up the the challenge mm -hmm. because it, it zero hit points. You just need to hit them with you know some type of a healing spell. And they're back up again and fighting their next round so 
um, with something like Death Strike, you're already a, a, in danger of rolling a one on your next death on your death save, and you died. So it won't happen very often, but it would allow a character to just outright die if that's if you run into somebody who has Death Strike. Other types of feats that we're looking at are um, feats that would complement some of the new classes that don't take things away from it. So I, I you know, that without going to gr a lot of great detail about all the different feats, I think that kind of gives you an idea of at least one of them. Yeah. Um, and I get the, I get the feeling that when, that when it comes to, when it comes, when it comes to the feats that you have within it, would it be fair to say that, that a good chunk of the feats are, are, um, not one note that they lean more in, ter in terms of multi-purpose? Yeah, and that's the other thing we, we, we put when we put them together. Um, certainly, we want to play test them all and get feedback. That's part of our development process when the Kickstarter's over. We're going to take input from everybody. And if people say, wait, you missed something here, um, I'm not the arrogant kind of person. I want to hear the feedback mm -hmm. um, from things. So we'll have a PDF out there. It'll float. We'll, we'll do a feedback phase. Everybody who backs this will be one of our stakeholders. I can't please everybody, right? I'm never going to make everybody happy with everything, but if I can get rid of some of the glaring things, I will. So one of the things we tried to do is make the feats a multi-purpose. So they're not one trick pony. Like Lucky's a one trick pony, right? You just yeah. get to, you know, it's a, it's a, so we try to get away from that type of, you know, what I'm calling a one trick pony to being able to do more things with them as well. And most of the feats uh, that we put in there, a lot of them we did, you where you also add to an ability score, because in many cases, adding plus two to an ability score is better than most. I'm going to be honest, Andy, how many feats do you pick or do you take a plus two to your intelligence with your, when you play a wizard? If I, the only time I take a feat is, yeah, I'll take the plus two if it, if it gets me to a 16 or an 18. You know, yeah. other than that, I don't, I don't take the feat. So. Right, you won't right. take, you'll, you'll take the ability I'll score. I'll take once. the ability score over the feat. It's just me. Yeah, and that's most... I, I, most people I know play that way. They'll just take, they don't even use the feats, you know? So we're trying to make them, you know, useful again and still have a plus one so that you, you know, you're getting something towards your primary scores out of it. Yeah. Um, and then it multi-purpose. So that's it. The problem is, of course, unless you throw out all of the feats and redesign it from scratch and say, only use mine, then you can't do much. You can't overpower them with what 5e currently has. If that makes it's sense, supplemental. We, it's we supplemental. We want to keep it. We wanted to keep it supplemental. We could redesign it from the ground up, but that wasn't the. That's not really the scope of what we're trying to do in this book. Yeah, we're trying to make it so you can add it to your current campaign and not redesign the rules. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. There, are, there are, there are some, uh, there are some campaign settings that are, and some expansions that are more in the realm of total conversion, but. Um, the way the way you describe it, Dalreth is not one of them. Yeah, I, I think the one of the marketing pieces and one of the useful pieces we're trying to keep it so it's familiar. Mm -hmm. So the races are still, you know, all of our different races species are same power level. Um, the feats are the same power level. The background option is the same power level. Um, I, I think it's actually more challenging to build it that way. It'd be really easy to make feats at a different power level. It's really hard to balance them against existing feats. Yeah. Right. So it's the easy way out would just be to throw out everything and rebuild the system from scratch. And trust me, I've thought about that during this process to say, you know what, let's um, let's just make a whole new system. But um, I think we've gone so far down the path, and we have some good material that we that this is the right way to go with it. And then the feats itself themselves, you just keep them balanced to what they have, and they're pretty good. It would be to me, I think they, you know, in many cases, I would have more feats available. I may have feats, and if I were to house rule it as a DM, I might give the plus two and a feat, right, for a character. But mm -hmm. I think then you're going to have challenge rating problems where now you're kind of making players over the challenge rating of the encounters so and 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 remember we're we're getting rid of that term challenge rating well Is no that, the term's that, there the term's well, still there I mean, you're well, thinking just you, the whole andy, andy hates it but the garbage no. a plus b equals c crap you know <laughs> but the challenge it, rating lets a dm know kind of how difficult the monster is. right then bump it by two and then and then All you're right. then you have a game anyway <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, we're going to stick with it. That way you can use material in any setting. That's really right, our right. final goal. I know you'd like to, but yeah, that's what we have to stick with. Right, right. Um, well, that's why God made house rules. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can do whatever you want in your own house, right? Yeah. I right, don't care. Right. It's, no, yeah, it's just it's, yeah, the, the it, terminology. It's brutal. It's brutal in Andy's world and Andy's basement. I just want to throw that in there. It's you could you could run into Demogorgon at first level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you run away. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Now, when now um, on the Kickstarter page, and may, maybe this is going to get retitled later on, but you have the Mentalist as a new spellcasting class. And I'm, ge I'm guessing yep. that's going to be re rechristened as um, Mind Weaver. Mind um, Weaver, as of as soon as I can update it. Yep. Yeah. Now, what I'm curious about when it comes to it being a new spell casting class is what does it bring to the spell casting sandbox as opposed to the uh, warlock, as opposed to the wizard, and as opposed to um, the sorcerer. Okay, so this is this is my design baby. So um, um, this is what what we have. The big thing about the mind weaver we're calling it now is the all of the the magic is derived from your mind mm -hmm. rather than from the essence around you or from some spirit or god, you know, from channeling, you know, druid or clerical channeling. So it's all internal magic. So. Even if you're unconscious, you can still think. So the mentalist can cast even while unconscious. So that's number certain one. Spells, that's certain, certain spells. Certain spells are unconscious cast, so, castable spells. They they just go off in an un, like like a, a a stabilization, if you will. Right. Their version of it. And the mentalist, because it's kind of mind over body, has some a dabbling of healing, self healing only so they can heal themselves while unconscious. So that's one of the things that's a kind of a paradigm shift that most people will have not seen before. Um, the, the, the mind weaver can also have spells. I mean, you've seen some of the wizard spells that are, you know, deep thoughts or detect thoughts or, or along those. They'll have those as well. Um, they'll but, also they're have... be, but, the, but of course, because of the nature of the class, uh, they're going to be more amped because the wizard is the end all be all they can do. They, they can pretty much cast, uh, they dabble in everything because these are specialized mentalist spells. Of course, they're going to be a little more amped at the, res at the respective level. And it'll be different. It'll be different, higher, more potent spells available as well. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 you're kind of hearkening back to your true ESP your true mind control type magic as well. So there's there's different spheres within the mind weaver. You've got the you know the the, the body stabilization type type lists you know type spells. Then you have the mind thoughts type of spells, and then you have the mind control types of spells where you can control other people. They you also have the most important one, D. The senses. The senses you forgot, as well. Yeah, mind pain. No, there's Don't mind pain, pain as well. There so will be instead pain. Instead of having, there will be pain. That Andy yeah. loves the mind pain, pain, pain spells. Pain but, time. Um, but the mind, the mind, the mind pain stuff is uh, singularly focused and of course won't do you much good against a uh, you know, uh, an iron golem or, uh, you know, an undead because they don't have minds, but against sentient beings they can do things so they're not the fireball wielders you mm -hmm. won't be casting the fireball at 40 goblins but maybe that goblin chief you can go make him start screaming something if he you can right, like a it. little girl or, yeah or retreat it, retreat right that kind would, of it, thing. would it be a case where um instead instead of throwing the fireball at 40 goblins the uh, mind weaver would would rather make the goblins fight each fight each other and do the work for him yeah, that's that's ex a me mental manipulation. If you think of the mind weaver, absolutely, and and particularly the biggest baddest one, the, whoever's got the most courage out of the bunch, you turn them. You, you, you that's the one you that's the one you kind of pick on. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's the mind weaver. That's what it does. And so the other things, um, um, the other things you got to think about with the mind weaver is that the 
they get the pain piece, but then they also have the senses piece. So because we're kind of thinking of them in a way, almost like, almost like fortune tellers in a way. So they can also do um, futuristic type thoughts. They can go and get a dream and find out what a course of action might take in the future. Those seer. types of things, a seer type thought. So there's four or five different spheres. Well, there's five right now. I may condense them into four. There's five different spheres that they can go into. And then the mind weaver then could be really in a sense subclassed in a way and focused on any of those. It's a true full class. It's not just a subclass yeah. overhaul. And so there'll be different focuses. So you may have, a, I don't want to have a mind weaver be able to do all of those things. Right, so we have to separate those out to have multiple subclasses that are kind of focused. So you have a seer type subclass, you have an astrologer, you know, seer astrologer type subclass. You might have one that that does the pain, the one that Andy likes, right? The one that brings pain on people, um, and that might be more like your traditional um, witch type subclass, if that makes sense. You know, the, the kind of the cursing kind of uh, from the old harken back to Dragon 32 or whatever it was, mm -hmm. um, that kind of a, a kind of a, a subclass. And then also, you know, your, your, your mind control, your mind reading, which would be almost like a, um, in a way, like a psychic, I guess, or palm reader as well. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at those. We've got to come up with the right names for each of the subclasses still, and we're working through those. But yeah, that's that's really where the mind weaver is going. And it's going to be significant um, expansion material so that you have a fully playable subclass and subclass is with yeah. it. Um, will the mind weaver be using the um, the whole spell charges thing, or will they have their own um, method of resource? PowerPoints, most likely. Well, we wanted PowerPoints where they just did that, but that, that harkens too much towards psionics. And I don't think they've ever really gotten psionics to work well in Dungeons and Dragons. So it'll probably be at the same power, uh, familiar power spell level like you would see from a wizard. Just to keep it balanced, you follow the chart, the same chart that the. Yeah, same kind of chart, just kind of balance. Cleric, sorcerer, wizard, count. As yeah. far as that goes. Now, what, what we will say is because it is uh, spells derived from the mind, mm -hmm. uh, no verbal or semantic components. You know, they're they're component free, if you will. Right. So they don't have to they don't have to you know flail their arms right or mm -hmm. um, speak you know do um, do any of that. All right. That's Sorry, it. I think I faded out there on you. They don't have to <laughs> flail their arms or have material components or anything. Yeah, mostly because that that just that just wouldn't make sense when it's all when it's all in the head. I mean, may, maybe exactly. Maybe if I, maybe if I wanted to really stretch it, they uh, for certain spells they'd have to have a, a the uh, components they'd, they'd have to use would be like would would be would be um stuff stuff like taking like dropping Ayahusica or something like that. <laughs> Um, right, possibly a material component on a, on a very you know like maybe some scrying or mm -hmm. you know on a scry or something like that, but you know very few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, now, when it comes to some of the new schools of magic, what are what are some of the um, I'm get now I'm guessing a lot of these new schools are reflective of the setting. What can you tell me about some of these uh, magic schools? Andy, I'll let you handle that one. Well, no, not, as far as new schools, that that's UD as far as like the Mind Weaver schools. No, no, are, he's talking are about only the, new no, schools wizards, per se. The well, no, no, but that, that those are actually uh, spells within the same schools. If you follow okay. what I'm saying, because no, it will fall, question. it will fall under evocation or divination. You know, basically I think he's referring to the wizards. Or, well, are you referring to like the wizards, like the lava wizard, the the, yes, I, this wizard. Yeah, Andy, he's talking about that. Uh, okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we touched on that last time. As far as the subclasses go, um, basically, uh, ra rather than sticking to a pure element like like the uh, the a pure element, we co we combined um, we combined the elements like earth and fire to make lava, uh, fire and air to make an inferno mage, and then. Uh, the water and uh, I'm sorry, water and air to make our ice uh, mm -hmm. ice mage. 
so the those are the three different um subclasses of the elementalists if you will and then the spells within each each of those of course are mostly evocation conjuration base mm -hmm. uh but again a, a lot of those different uh, a lot of those or the three subclass types obviously come from different part of the world um and i'll you know i'll leave that to your imagination from there yeah you know obvious obviously our uh our ice elves would have a good real estate block in in ice mages, you know. So so that that's a no brainer there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, lava and inferno, we'll leave those ones open for uh, for uh, for your yeah, open to your imagination. Because right. there, there's there's bad guys in in is that uh from that are from the areas where that magic is super prevalent. All right. Now, when it comes to the faction system, um, I'm curious how that how that's going to work. We've last time I had you on, we did talk a bit about the um, houses of Dalreth. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the faction system, there's just have just the way it's described about fame and notoriety. Um, the main thing that come the main thing that comes to mind is some is some sort of influence as resource, but I'm guessing that your system is going to be a little more in depth than just another than just a um, political currency. Right, right. It's not. Um, yeah, other ones are just like, oh yeah, I'm a harper. They all like me, and I can use. Mm -hmm. I can. They can. They, they send me missions or whatever, and I get a plus one ring or something. Right. It's not that. Um, really, the system is. Think of it as a. Um, how you'll interact with one character within a faction um, will affect your interactions again with others in the faction. It's gonna be a, it's a player by player basis. It's not the whole group. So your group can taint you, right? If the barbarian in your group goes and pukes up on the table, you're still tainted a little bit, mm -hmm. right? From being uncouth, right? For having you know puked all over the the noble's table or whatever i'm just using that as an example but you know he may lose a few favor points you're still going to lose something for you know the party theory you know your party to him so therefore you must be like him um kind of thing so but tell him um, the tell him the positive though the positive is of course now that you have those characters that are wait, wait. no let me interrupt darren oh Go ahead. But since it's the barbarian, you puked in that noble stable. The faction across the way actually despises that faction. Right. So you actually right. got a couple brownie points with the faction that doesn't like the other fact, the the noble faction that you puked on. You're the guy that puked on the Russell's table. I heard so, about you. So, right. So, yeah. so you're so they're buying your beers. Right. You might get a beer off that if you go mm -hmm. puke on a Russell's table and make it alive out of their house without, you know, losing your head off doing that. It's highly doubtful that you make it out of the room, but if you so, did, then you're the guy who did that, right? So that, that makes the whole political, yeah, because of the politics that are that are inlaid of this house doesn't like that house, this tri house is trying to one-up this house. Uh, because of all that, your interaction with that has positive and negative pending you know, pending which house does what. And then we have the rules for that in the player's guide. So you could use our factional system and drop that in your own in your own setting. So again, I'm trying to make the player's guide really modular in the sense that you can use it for anything. You don't have to wait to use it in Delreth. You could use it, I don't know, for the your Icewind Dale campaign and mm -hmm. drop it in there and use that type of a factional, add a few characters that are on different areas and use it. Now, the thing is, again, it's not a, um, it's not like a credit card or political capital in the sense that you get this because you did that. It's more of a, they won't do things to you or they will do things for you if you have those types of levels. Now, some of that, if you implement it on your own, you'll have to go through and figure out what those boons are and what they do and how those NPCs affect them. Whereas when we get to that point within our setting, all of that's built in. Right. So I built the entire setting from the ground up with this system built in place so that really the NPCs are people that aren't just somebody you go in and you meet for 10 minutes. They introduce you to it and you go an adventure on them and you never really do anything with them again. They're an integral part on the storyline, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so what you do to them builds up. They remember. 
right? It's like a living being that the DM gets to play and gives them that depth that they normally don't get. So you may be in been front in front of the king before and he gives you a quest, you get something for him, yay, you get played for it. You're happy now in this system with a factional system, he'll remember that. So the you know Duke Barton will remember you've done something for him. I and do so recommend with favor, all the house factions as a DM you keep good notes. Oh yeah, yeah. It does require bookkeeping, but I do. But I, a lot of that you can kind of keep in your mind too. But if you, you need to take notes on it, you need to, to record that, and that's one of the things um, you're going to want to log right when they do something that affects another house member. When you have a hundred different NPCs and twelve different factions, and you're doing things, you need to kind of account for that. Just to log it doesn't have to be complicated. And in the adventures that I write, everything you do will impact. And even things you come up with as a player, you're going to come up with things that a DM hadn't even thought of. The material isn't isn't done. You ad hoc run it. If you get this built in your mind to run it like a faction system, which I've really, this is 20 years we've been using this. They mm -hmm. just don't know it. Uh, and that's why, Andy, you make enemies. And they come back. And what happens when you have an enemy, Andy? Well, we fight all the time. Yeah, you get, they'll remember you so, when you stole that. I'm running, ring I'm them. running. I'm, I'm constantly, yeah. it, uh, if, if you play a chaotic character, you're constantly on the run. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, you just and, run. And that's, that's what it is. So if you're the kind of, if you have the kind of players that like to burn everything down in a town, this will work really well to kind of mold well, them. No, to there's thinking, consequence. There's, there's consequence. consequences for your mm -hmm. actions. Yep. Yeah, so you'll, 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 that's a system. Even that alone is a gem because once you once you start thinking that way and running it that way, it's an entirely different kind of a game that you're running. You're running. I call it a political game, but maybe that's the wrong word. It's more like um, you know, it's 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 more like an interactive. Yeah. Right, where you're, you're interacting with the NPCs. I call it everything politics nowadays, but it's really it, it, and they they remember right? Yeah. How you interacted before with, just like you do, right? If you meet somebody, you remember that first impression, mm -hmm. right? Of what you got from them. So same kind of thing, yeah. but built into a game system. Now I do have a further question when it comes to, when it comes to that setup and that, and that is a lot of times whenever I, whenever I do games that eventually go into high levels, usually that, usually that's when I have the, um, I have the player characters, um, have more of have more of a active use their influence in more of an active role than rather rather um petitioning um mostly because one one um old school game that I'm fond of and I'm the, and uh, the developer is a friend of mine um is Adventure Conqueror King system and the idea with the idea with that particular game setup is that at higher levels you're get you're getting more followers and you're get and you're getting bigger and bigger holdings um and i look i look at the i look at the faction system here and i'm considering is there the possibility that at high, that at high level play um someone could potentially be a major player in one of the factions oh absolutely so originally when we ran this we had um andy's brother kirby Right, remember Andy? He was yeah. a Willoughby. He's actually one of the Willoughby characters that's um, in the faction now. So you could, as a DM, have somebody. It, the houses, of course, are birthright mainly related. Although my son wants to change that and think that the factions of those shouldn't only be the members of the house, right? Of the the blood. So we're we're, we're Evolving that a little bit, but yeah, you could very easily, the guilds, for example, have different layers of um, of the guild. So you could eventually be that guild person. You could take the factional system and the players could end up being in one or more faction with the same kind of a system set up, although it's not quite the same because as a guild leader, you wouldn't have a number tell you how to treat an NPC. If that makes sense, you wouldn't tell players that, okay, you're very favorable of them. You'd want the players to actually role play that. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it would guide that, but it might guide it the other way around. It might be. Yeah, when you're yeah. Higher it, level. It, it basically adds to a total big question mark on which way the plot's going to go. So, you, which is another thing that we've always embraced is as far as, yeah, if, if, if a PC steps up, t takes a place of the faction, and and turns it upside down, then you know Darren as a DM rolls accordingly. You know rolls with that. Is and that? I've had 
and really, and you're right. And and one of the things that was written in to our first game and happened in our first game because the players didn't take any action is one of the factions was nearly wiped out. They didn't really do anything. And so they didn't know this, but the, it was down to two, two NPCs left in the faction. The rest had mysteriously disappeared. And, you know, they didn't go and search to see what happened to rescue them. So they just all died. So you could conceivably have, you know, in the way the game is written, I don't want to mention which ones and any more details. But you can <laughs> lose an entire faction in the storyline that I have. So that's written. So if you do nothing or do the wrong thing, you could. So then, what, you know, what fills that power vacuum? So if all of a sudden all the thorns died off, who's going to be running the Wizard Academy? It's still building there. So maybe the players take that up or maybe other non-players come in and, and do that. So as players get higher level, mm -hmm. yeah, they could definitely not only play the role of a faction um, high-level member, but even, in a sense, take control of one of the factions if, they, if that's where the DM wanted to go. Yeah. And I'm not... I'm... And e even, even, with the, even with the whole... Um, the whole it's got to be by blood approach... There's ways around that. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> it's just more fun. Um, least of least of which be least of which being ha being having a sangramancer in a par in a party, and thus you can do blood transfusions. So therefore, it counts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But now, when it, now, um. When it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the um, weather within Dalrith, um, there's there's been men, there's been mention I think I think in the past and also before we went live that um, the we, that the um, weather the weather and the inha and the threats get more dangerous at night than they do in the day, but when it comes to the, when it comes to the use of extreme weather, is it a, is it a case where there's going to be rules if there if um, players are caught in the middle of a blizzard or something, or how deep into the rabbit hole are we going with this? Oh, you die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's there is no rabbit hole because you're dead. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so you're so callous with that. But yeah, if you wander off into the glacier and there's a blizzard and you have no way to protect it, we do have some spells. You want to tell them about the one of the spells, the find shelter spell. So if you have a ranger with the right spell, you can maybe find shelter, right, Andy? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we lost him. I think Is we lost him. Do you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. No. Wait, I was talking the whole time. You didn't hear any of that? No, you were... <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe that's good. Maybe it's good we didn't hear uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> okay, I'm at, no, no, you heard you die, right? You just yeah, die? Yeah, we heard that. Did you get that part? No, yeah, we have resist... There, there's resist element spells and, and, and newer spells with, with longer durations, you know, that are suitable for uh, the environment. But, yeah, again, you have to have those going in. Um, also, uh, yeah, just a little bit of player knowledge as far as talking to the locals, as far as knowing where like safe havens are, um, to, to, to make potential camps. I, I have, I'm the school of a DM that has no problem with having everybody roll new characters up in a, in a given moment. Um, so that makes it real, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's how I DM. I'm not saying that's how everyone else has to DM. I just have a, players that are you know mature enough to handle a complete wipeout, right? Where they made a mistake. I don't like don't you what, die. what I don't like is yeah. this. I don't like the 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 death type saves, save or die, and he didn't know it was coming. Mm -hmm. You usually did it, right, Andy? You you did it. Oh, you yeah. earned it when you die, right? Oh That's sure, just, sure. Yeah. You did. You did not take the extra precautions to to not get caught out in in the blizzard. 
And so, I can give an example of an encounter I did once. It was a, a necklace, and it was around a skeletal corpse, and the necklace was had a little message on it that says, do not wear. So <laughs> what did our rogue do? But put that the necklace Cor of strangulation that was over Corey. her that head. Was Corey. No, that, that was happened Corey? twice, actually. I, re I redid that with uh, Gina. And she put it, sorry, Gina, if you're listening, but she put it over her head without hesitation. And everybody else at the table, it was like a slow motion, like everybody knew it was oh, going to wow. strangle her to death. Um, so, you know, I don't like the necklace of strangulation just thrown in without something like that, but I'll throw in something like that. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? It actually was a random, uh, random magic item that they discovered and I hit it on a chart and that's how I like to run games is you have, you know, things that can threaten players and, but I didn't just put it out there. I put it like on a skeleton with a note on it. So you mm -hmm. shouldn't probably put it on, but some people just, you know, curiosity kills them. Literally, right? Literally, yeah. So, so that's how I do it. So, if you're if you're caught out in a blizzard, back to your question, you know, and you're unprepared, and I think as a DM, if you're running this setting, I'm now you could be you could give them a break. You could have, you know, Tutmos and Slip just happen to wander by and save them. So there's there's ways you could keep it from happening if your party won't accept that, or if you're a DM that's a little bit more kinder than I am. Mm -hmm. But when I run the game, I probably it's in the probably, dice. Yeah. It's in the dice you roll. Yeah. So that's how that goes. Did that answer your question? I don't know if that helps. Yeah, right. yeah I'd say it does. Um, now, when it comes, now you guys just you guys just set the um, just set it up just set up the um, Kickstarter like like we said yesterday. Um, now I'm gonna knock on wood for a moment. Now, presuming that um, that we that it actually gets to its goal um, on the tw on the twenty fifth of next month, um, mm -hmm. what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you think Are you thinking December? Or are you thinking um, early twenty twenty one? Yeah, and so the um, what we're we're our tentative plan is that um, we would have all the writing done. Um, and ready for like a plate, like a, I call it a stakeholder review, mm -hmm. it's called a play tester review um, in November so that we can get feedback, right? Um, that doesn't give everybody a lot of time to actually play and play through a character and use it in their own campaign settings, but it'll let us get it out to everybody. So I'd like to see at least a semi unformatted version, right? That'll be in Word document type of PDF, or it'll be in a PDF, but it won't have all of our integrated graphics into it um, in November. See if there's anything glaring. We'll probably have a two to four week review window while we go through editing, right? So we have an editor that'll, that was, and she'll edit it all for us. And Jenny, you do a wonderful job. So there's a throw out to you if you're listening. And then we'll move it over to layout after we're sure it's all edited correctly and that any feedback that came in. So we're really looking at uh, probably a January you know, for it being into a finalized PDF. So January, February would be when we're looking to get it really print ready. And then after that, I put down July because I don't even know on delivery what it's going to be like with our postal system. I took three weeks for a box to get to Chicago last month and it sat in our postal change and the Chicago is uh, 90 miles away or 100 miles away mm -hmm. it took three weeks and it was three different boxes all sent priority mail so I have no idea I can't promise anything on delivery it could take a month to get a, even after I get the books from the printer it could take a month to get out the door right for them mm -hmm. to to get delivered so uh, certainly July is a very um um, you know, we'll beat that from a timeline for the, the miniatures we did, even in the middle of the whole COVID going on, we were and even I had to re strike one of the miniatures because one of the, the swords were off on production. So I had to go back to retooling. I still delivered all the miniatures and got them all out the door. Um, for anybody that filled their, their pledge system out, um, I got them all out the month before. So we were able to deliver a month ahead of time, which is pretty unheard of with a lot of Kickstarters where you're, even when you have hiccups, to still be able to deliver before mm -hmm. when you promised. So ideally, you know, we would like to have it out to everybody in uh, the PDF by the finalized, beautiful looking PDF by the end of January with layout. 
Um, and that's really the key part, right? That's where you can start using it. The hardcover then, I mean, that's a question mark as to when the hardcover would get printed and everything with that. Um, it may take a, a month or a few months to actually get it out to everybody, but certainly by July All for right. the hardcover. And I'll def I'll definitely be looking forward to it. And um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure there will be no shortage of ice puns at my table because there because well, one of one of my guy one of my guys likes likes breaking into Arnie impressions. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we may have some of this out as PDFs earlier, so um, I may move forward with, for example, Carl Danes has been doing a knockout job with some of the the writing. So mm -hmm. his stuff may show up pretty soon, and we may do those as, uh, you know, early release once we get this funded and start uh, get it laid out, and we may get that out for early review. So you might start seeing material, you know, the moment the Kickstarter closes, we'll start floating it out there for feedback. So, you, you know, you might take some of this and be able to use it in your game right now. Um, and if and if on Knockwood or if Knockwood, if it doesn't fund, we'll, we'll we'll come up with another way to still get the material out to everybody. Yeah. Um, it just, just probably wouldn't be in a printed format then. Yeah, I just right? I just don't want to tempt the gods of irony. Um, <laughs> well, well, even if it even if it doesn't make the it's really for the printing funds is what we're looking at. If it doesn't make the printing funds, a PDF option is available too. We put a lot of heart and soul into this, mm -hmm. and so even if we don't succeed, this is our first major Kickstarter. So I'm learning a lot of lessons from it, and I think the next go around will be, you know, something that will be even better. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, it's, you know, it's it's off to uh, it's off to an okay start for being a day. But you know, everybody wants to fund within three hours. We did, we weren't able to do that, and um, so we're still working at it. We're getting we're about a third of the way there now, so of getting it funded. So in one day, that's not that's not too bad. But I think the expectations have changed a lot in Kickstarter. Like you need to fund it in 30 minutes to be considered successful. To me, I had to be honest with you, just having anybody interested in the stuff we write is success to me. Mm -hmm. So if you use it and play it, that makes that makes me happy. So um, whether we get, you know, when we can uh, get the funding for printing it, right, um, that's a different story. But I want to make sure that it succeeds. So I don't want to, I didn't want to put a lower level on the Kickstarter funding amount and then, you know, run into printing issues where I, you know, couldn't afford to print it and couldn't afford to distribute it and do all that work. So I needed to set that there. But a PDF will still do that even if there's a problem with uh, with getting the funds for printing. Mm -hmm. and, and nowadays everybody's playing online. So maybe that's the approach, you know, we should have taken from the beginning. Who knows? Yep. Art covers better. Yeah, <laughs> I, do. I do. Well, and you can always print it. You know, I can always do a print on demand as well for anybody. For, sure. for Mildred, we'll get you a print on demand. You'll get a hardcover. How's that sound? I, I mean, just <laughs> you know. Yeah, which I do. I do appreciate. Um, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to um, come on to the show and enjoy the madness. Oh, it's always a pleasure coming here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us, man. My, ple my pleasure. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, next time we'll have some ale. <laughs> Perfect. Going, going for ale instead of wine. A man after my own heart. Oh, yeah. I'm not a wine drinker. I'm an ale drinker. As, an, as, any, as any decent Midwesterner should be. Leave the, <laughs> leave the wine for the Californians. <laughs> No disrespect right. to my Californian brothers, but um, you know how it is. <laughs> that's right. Well, I'm I'm a, I'm a mug of ale and a leg of, leg of mutton. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's who I am. Yep. So, yep. Um, and of course, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the show. And there'll be plenty more craziness where that comes from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!